All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the San Anselmo Library's Virtual Art Talk Tuesday, American Abstract at Mid-Century. I'm Sarah Yana, the Adult Services Librarian at the San Anselmo Library. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Friends of the Library and the Library Parsa Talks for sponsoring this program and all library programs. Everyone will remain muted until the end of the presentation. If you have a question, please type it into the chat box. I will be monitoring the chat and will alert April to any questions we receive there. We will be recording this program and I will also send the link out later today or early tomorrow. Technology can be very fickle and I want to thank you all in advance for your patience and understanding during this program. Our speaker today is Avril Angevine. Avril is an arts lecturer with a particular interest in modern and contemporary art and California art. She has lectured on both subjects at various locations in the Bay Area, including the OLLI programs at Cal State East Bay and Dominican College. Avril has an MA in Comparative Literature from the UC Berkeley and teaches English and Humanities at local colleges. She is also a museum, gu museum guide at SFMOMA and a docent at OMCA. Please join me in welcoming back Avril Angevine, Avril Angevine to Virtual Art Talk Tuesday. Woo, yay! <laughs> oh, lovely. Thank you, Sariana. You got it. <laughs> and here we go. I hope um, I'm imagining you all at the San Anselmo Library. I hope you're not underwater with all the water we had yesterday. That's a problem up there, right? <laughs> but it's good. It's good we have some water. Uh, happy to be here uh, talking to you today. Our subject today, as you said, is abstract expressionism. American art at mid-century. So I'm gonna share the screen over here. Uh, share and slideshow from the beginning. Yes, from the beginning. Yeah, there we go. Uh, okay, and as Sariana said, if you have any questions as we go through, kind of type them into the chat and she'll, she'll read them to me. That'd be good. And I'm gonna do this one. Yeah, no, no. Okay, there we go. Uh, all right, so abstract expressionism, American art at mid-century. This is the art that many people consider to be the absolute best, the high point in, uh, in American art. But at the very least, it's the first American art that was taken really seriously in the art world. The abstract expressionism of the 40s and 50s, what we call the New York School. Now, abstraction as a style of Western art uh, began right around the turn of the century, actually. Uh, but these early 20th century abstractionists uh, rejected use of the human figure or of anything else recognizable uh, in an effort to uh, search for the spiritual. In other words, an effort to understand universal forces that are greater than uh, what humanity or even nature uh, has wrought. Now, to a great extent, their uh, search came in response to the materialism and to the rapid and extreme changes that the modern machine age was producing in the Western world. And certainly later than that, to the catastrophic effects of World War I. Uh, but by the 20s and 30s, the search for understanding shifted from the spiritual plane, we might say, to the level of the individual psyche on the one hand, which gave us surrealism, and to the political world on the other, which gave us what's called social realism. And both of these are relevant in the development of abstract expressionism in the 40s. So surrealism over there, the ideas of Sigmund Freud about the power of the unconscious on human actions were taken up by the surrealist artists, mostly in France, who gelled into a group, coincidentally, just the time that Freud's works were being translated into French. Their goal was exploration of those mysterious unconscious forces that guide our behavior. Now, many surrealist paintings could also be considered abstract as we often observe in someone like Joan Miro here. Other surrealist works fall somewhere between abstraction and figuration, such as what we see in Dali, Salvador Dali and his kind of strange and often weird combinations. While other surrealists like René Magritte uh, were as far from abstraction as possible, but they give a supreme sense of otherworldliness. 
Now, Surrealism, of course, traveled across the Atlantic and gained many followers in the United States. But on this side of the pond, as they say, it ran into a different vibe, and that was the social realist style, what came to be called American scene painting that took hold in the desperate 30s. So in these works, many of which appeared in murals created through the WPA and other government agencies, art regains a political edge and a social function. Now, abstraction was not really suited to this task and was strenuously avoided. Some artists, it is true, did manage to combine surrealism and social realism, locating the irrationality central to surrealism in social and political life, such as this industrial symph uh, symphony, it's called, by the New England surrealist, if that's not an oxymoron of some sort, named James Guy. So it's through surrealism and surrealism's concern to express something about the individual's interior world that abstraction really enters American painting. Many of the painters I'm going to discuss today were surrealists before they committed to abstraction. And as with the early forms of abstraction, uh, it was a world war that kickstarted the movement away from representation. Now, <clears throat> Paris, I'm sure you know, had been the center of Western art production for a couple of centuries, but the Nazi invasion kind of put an end to that. And it was very sad. Of course, after the war, art was still being made in Paris and certain American artists such as Sam Francis or Ellsworth Kelly and even Jean Kelly uh, went to Paris for inspiration. But the far larger movement was westward Many French, German, and Eastern European artists migrated to New York before and during the war for more basic reasons than art, really. So we have Marcel Duchamp, Hans Hoffmann, Max Ernst, and Pete Mondrian brought abstraction with them. Uh, André Breton, <clears throat> Yves Tanguy, Marc Chagall, and Fernand Léger brought surrealism. And through their exhibitions and their teaching, these European emigres provided an electrical charge that eclipsed American scene painting and established New York as the world's art capital. But of course, the centrality of New York reflected a political reality too. After the war, America was certainly great. The leading nation economically, militarily, and morally, and young American artists, many of whom had served in the war, were full of enthusiasm and cultural invincibility. The seeds brought by the European emigres when planted in New York produced a unique and fabulous kind of fruit. So this is how the New York School was born, not as a unified movement, just as a small group of artists who hung out at the Cedar Tavern on April, West 8th Street. Yes. Yeah, sorry to bother you. Betty. No, it's okay I, to bother me. Go ahead. So that was that was um, hmm. that was out of habit. Uh, it's my job to bother you right now. Um, yeah. Betty has a question. Who is the woman in the photo? Um, oh, in that photo of the Europeans, I believe that is Peggy Guggenheim. And she should be credited because she was very important. I believe that's Peggy Guggenheim, but I'm not positive. <laughs> good question. Good catch. Okay. Uh, good. Is that, was there another one or is that it? Sorry, on. That's it for now. Okay, good. Uh, so here they are uh, at the Cedar Tavern on West 8th Street um, in New York, and they just exploded everything anybody knew about making art. They were to art what the European existentialists were to literature right? Seekers of meaning in an irrational universe who valued not merely the thinking subject, but the acting, feeling, living human individual. And they wanted an art that reflected the deeply human and tapped into inner sources through direct, unplanned expression of feeling, right? So there we have Jean-Paul Sartre over there with his pipe and Jack the Dripper, Jackson Pollock with his cigarette. So the abstract expressionists really seized on the surrealist automatic anti-rational art making of free gesture and improvisation. So spontaneity and process, that is how the art actually was made was crucial. And yet in a famous letter to the New York Times in uh, June, 1943, Adolf Gottlieb and Mark Rothko wrote to us, Art is an adventure into an unknown world of the imagination, which is fancy free and violently opposed to common sense. 
There is no such thing, they continued, as a good painting about nothing. We assert that the subject is critical. Okay, this may surprise you. How can the subject be critical in an abstract painting where it looks like there is no subject? Well, there are a couple of ways to respond to that. On the one hand, the stunning formal innovations that we see in this kind of art were created in a search for absolutes in human life and experience, not in the spirituality that the early abstractionists sought. So Carl Jung's ideas about the collective unconscious were as central to the abstract expressionists as Freud's had been to the surrealists. Early works such as uh, Arshiel Gorky's The Liver is the Coxcomb, right? <laughs> were full of kind of biomorphic elements, um, you know, things that kind of look like they come from biology, shapes could be human type shapes a little bit, and references to primitive myth and archaic art used as personal symbols. So what it means is the psyche of the artist spontaneously rendered was effectively the subject of, a, of an abstract expressionist work. But another way of looking at the question of subject is simply this the creation of the work was the subject. The process of painting what were normally very, very large canvases involved not just the wrist, but the entire body. And engaging fully with the application of paint was what made you an artist. Uh, this is why the stuff was called action painting. And in a sense, this was the culmination of a movement begun with the Impressionists of making the canvas itself more significant than what it was representing. So the abstract Expressionists thus had it both ways, as painting itself was both the process and the subject of the painting. But unlike something like Cubism, in which all efforts are constructed similarly, and you may remember that early Picasso and early Brock, you can't tell the difference between them. They're really doing the same thing. But with abstract expressionism, there were many different styles because the artist's personal stamp was so important. But that said, the artists tend to fall into two camps, the gesture painters and the color field painters. And they have several things in common. They both are really concerned with how the paint is actually applied to the canvas. And they both believe in spontaneity, that is lack of preparation, no underdrawing and stuff like that, that involves too rational a process of image making. They also believe in edge to edge application, right, in which no part of the painting is noticeably more important than another. And they are generally enormous. Now, these last two qualities are actually holdovers from the mural painting of the 30s, uh, murals are by their nature large, really big, and they generally fill their space uh, fully. So with that as an introduction, let's meet some serious, soulful, hard drinking artists of the New York School. We're going to start with the gesture artists. And of course, the top dog in this department is Jackson Pollock, who virtually alone created the image of the American cowboy macho artist, a sort of James Dean of the art world, drinking, misbehaving, and abandoning the normal tools of painting, such as brushes and an easel, uh, in his search for direct access to the turmoil in his psyche. Now, this caricature of Pollock is not completely accurate, of course. He was from Wyoming and he spent his youth in the West, but as a teen, he was artsy and was even interested in theosophy, which was the spiritual system that inspired Pete Mondrian and many of the early century um, abstractionists. And he only got into this cowboy image in New York when he studied with Thomas Hart Benton, the great American scene muralist who really was a Westerner. Pollock did not burst onto the scene as an abstract provocateur. He had training and he found inspiration in many of the early century artists, but he did have demons. Because he had lost part of a finger in a childhood accident involving an ax, his drawing was always kind of clumsy. He suffered from alcoholism, uh, as I'm sure you know, and was even hospitalized for it in the 1930s. And of course it led to his death in a car crash in 1956. He underwent Jungian analysis in the early 40s, which certainly enriched his work. He was a troubled and troubling soul. 
Now, his splatter paintings, for which uh, a wit at Life magazine named him Jack the Dripper, happened in a fabulous rush between 1947 and 1950. But prior to that, his work had been figurative. Okay, you don't recognize this as Jackson Pollock. Uh, symbolic and mythological. <clears throat> so, oops, what did I do here? Oh, um, there we go, got it. Uh, this is uh, Guardians of the Secret, which you recognize from SF MoMA, it's up all the time. So in works like this one, before he really goes into the drip mode, he usually begins with a figure, which he then hid. And you can see lots of them in here. There's the kind of dog or coyote at the bottom. There's a Coco Pelli, there's faces and so forth. And we can see this too in uh, the mural that he did for Peggy Guggenheim's apartment in New York. Uh, there are black figures marching all across it. Um, this, of course, uh, referring to this all over style, critics called it everything from glorified wallpaper to baked macaroni. But in Pollock's words, it was a stampede of every animal in the American West, cows and horses and antelopes and buffaloes, everything is charging across that goddamn surface, is what he said. Okay, so Pollock actually was searching for a way to create a continuous line rather than a stroke, no matter how long it might be, made by a brush. And the way he did this was to pour house paint from a can along a stick that was resting inside the container so that a continuous stream of paint dripped onto the canvas, which was left unstretched on the floor. The character of the line could be varied by the thickness of the paint, the angle and the speed of the pouring, and the dynamics of his bodily gestures. So this is an early drip work of her, his called Full Fathom Five. Uh, in this one, he actually started with an underlayer made with brush and palette knife, and then he dripped on top of it. Uh, the grayish kind of silver in here is uh, aluminum radiator paint, apparently. And there are tacks, coins, cigarette butts, and other assorted junk embedded into the surface. And once he began to drip, he didn't touch the canvas except to step on it. And here's a close-up of this, how this looks. And you notice it, the close-up is focusing on the red, which there's very little of in here. It's down there at the lower right, I guess. So you can see the way that looks. Pollock called his painting studio his arena, thus making himself like a bullfighter or a gladiator. A work was an environment around which he danced, throwing paint from all sides. In fact, the works had no right orientation. Uh, deciding how to hang them came later. From 1947 to 1950, as I said, Pollock stayed sober and produced some of the most dazzling, absorbing works ever achieved in American art. Their sheer size is impressive, but more impressive really is the delicacy of the lines and slashes of paint, which arch and swirl everywhere at once. They aren't messy or muddled as they would be if done by the famous five-year-old who many people figure could do any abstract work, uh, or if it was done by you or by me, it would not look like this. Uh, his Pollock's wife, the painter Lee Krasner, marveled at how he could work in the air and yet know exactly where the paint would land. He seemed to enter a trance state when painting, as though he had broken through the difficult personality he struggled with and attained something like the transcendent state that the early abstractionists saw. Visitors to a 1950 exhibit said it was like walking into a meteor shower. And think about this, his painting style, as much as his personal style has been parodied, but while a good forger, a good painter could forge a Vermeer, no one could exactly replicate a Pollock, how could you? So here's green silver, one that I like. And let's look at Autumn Rhythm, an enormous painting. He would even take the skin that formed on the top of a paint can and throw that on the canvas. Here's a close up of it that shows you that there's quite a bit of uh, unprimed canvas there showing. And finally, blue poles. Uh, it is, of course, really hard to get a sense of these works without uh, being in front of them. 
Now, Pollock fell off the wagon in 1950, and in the last few years of his life, his drinking and his erratic behavior increased. He gave up color in 1951 and attempted to develop a new style, applying paint from a turkey baster, sort of like the later color field painters would do. So here's an example. Okay, you can't really say that he advanced, but did he have to? His work is a testament to what can happen when an artist is in the zone, totally in sync with herself and her cultural moment. Cultural historian Camille Paglia called him a shooting star. And like James Dean, he checked out way too soon. Now Pollock's contemporary, his friend and rival, number two to Pollock's number one, and sometimes number one to Pollock's number two was Willem de Kooning. Uh, de Kooning, who was born in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, is considered a protean artist in the mold of Picasso, someone so prodigiously talented that he transcended all puny definitions, such as style or influence. And in that sense was kind of an artist's artist. But he looked for inspiration in the world rather than inside himself. And so he sometimes complicated abstract expressionism by some figural references, especially in the series of six woman paintings he did from 1950 to 1953, which set both conservative and avant-garde critics howling, of course, for different reasons. But de Kooning didn't really care about styles or labels. He only wanted to be inspired. And as he once said, flesh was the reason oil paint was invented. So de Kooning arrived in New York, uh, having stowed away on a freighter in 1926 when he was 22, hoping to become a commercial artist. He had extensive and rigorous training uh, in drawing in the Netherlands. And once in the United States, he worked as a house painter. So in this sketch of his wife, we can see his technical training, the actual skill he had. Uh, so his technical training and his familiarity with loose paint and big brushes from his um, house painting career combined to form the basis of his process. De Kooning was always open about his debt to other artists, such as his mentor, Arshil Gorky, and to the importance of continued contact with his peers. In 1949, uh, de Kooning and 17 other artists founded the club, a loft on East 8th Street where they gathered to talk and to drink too. And Pollock, of course, was a frequent and boisterous uh, attendee. Now, like Jackson Pollock, de Kooning also was a problem drinker, but in other ways, they were quite different. Pollock succeeded by overcoming his artistic drawbacks, while de Kooning had to overcome the skill acquired through his extensive training. I'll put one of his works up here. De Kooning struggled to attain the freedom and spontaneity that was natural to Pollock. De Kooning worked and reworked and reworked his paintings and hesitated to show them. He didn't have a solo show until he was 44, although he was already well known to the New York art crowd as an inspirational figure uh, with the most solid grounding in art techniques and art history of anybody. But while his works have the same abstract expressionist spirit as Pollock's, they were constructed differently. They often seem incomplete as though the forms were moving and coming into definition. Now his continual reworking of his canvases testifies to the importance of process for him as well as for the others. And in this sense, his paintings like Pollock's can rightly be called action paintings. The painting is an event, an encounter between the artist and the materials rather than a finished work in the traditional sense. So in this early work called Pink Angels, you can find echoes of Miro, we saw before, and colors kind of from Matisse as de Kooning's method was really coming into shape. He would often draw shapes onto paper and then trace them onto the canvas, which allowed him to layer and to create a shifting animation of the work's surface. And he doesn't try to hide this process, the charcoal underdrawing can be seen here uh, outlining the shapes. Now, again, while most of the abstract expressionists in their religion of spontaneity denied that they made sketches, de Kooning actually found a way that allowed for construction and reconstruction while retaining an aura of spontaneity. 
So if you look here, these shapes, mm, you know, they're again, they're biomorphic. They look kind of like body parts. You can always sense that there's something in there that you're seeing or missing. Many people claim, of course, that the human eye searches for something recognizable in any abstract painting, but in de Kooning, you can often find something. Or in this work, Asheville from 1948, if you start looking in there, you're gonna see things. I see a house up at the top and eyes and things like this. Um, in his first solo exhibition in 1948, de Kooning showed compositions like this one in black and white with vaguely recognizable shapes and a complex play of figure and ground. In other words, what's the background and what's the actual painting on it, the lines on it, um, which he said was always his true subject. And it's interesting that although abstract painters completely give up the skill that their predecessors had in creating a sense of depth on a canvas, still there sometimes is a sense of depth. There's certainly a difference between what's in the front and what's, what's behind it. And certainly the reduction of the palette to black and white amplifies this tension between the foreground and the background. And the calligraphic lines remind us that he was once a sign painter. Now, abstract expressionists like Pollock were interested in symbols and ideographs as a way to communicate a universal human emotion or experience. And the critic Harold Rosenberg even claimed that organic shapes could carry an emotional charge just like numbers, mathematical signs, or letters of the alphabet could. And if I can do this, can you see my thing? Like, okay, how about this shape down there? <laughs> Does that have a universal symbol to it? I don't know. Uh, you keep looking, you might find more of these. <laughs> okay, he's cool. Now, this work called Excavation is the biggest painting that de Kooning ever made. Unlike the others, this is another difference. He was a committed easel painter. So this is about six and a half feet by eight feet, much smaller than a typical work by Jackson Pollock or Mark Rothko. And de Kooning explained, if I stretch my arms out and wonder where my fingers are, that's all the space I need as a painter. And he felt to move beyond this scale, he would risk losing the human intimacy of the space. Now, Pollock, of course, clearly wanted to go beyond his human reach. So this excavation is, again, an all over painting with no obvious point of entry, though there's something that looks kind of like a door down at the bottom that might be a way in. Um, it's a super example of the tension between abstraction and figuration that was inherent in de Kooning's work. And believe it or not, uh, the point of departure for this was an image of women working in a rice field from uh, a 1949 Italian neorealist film called uh, Bitter Rice. Are you ready? Here's the inspiration for this, <laughs> right? Okay, you see them in there? All right, let's go back and look at it. So if you look in here, you can see bird shapes, fish, you can see smiles, nose, necks, jaws. And the title actually reflects the composition, an intensive building up and scraping down of its paint layers uh, until the desired effect was achieved. Um, these paintings were not generally created in a rush. They often took months uh, to paint. Now, de Kooning engaged with a more defined figuration in his Woman series. Okay, here's the one that's at SF MoMA. All six of them were exhibited in 1953 and purists were shocked, but in many ways, these works continued the path he had been on of um, dancing between figuration and abstraction in some silks. Now his aggressive women are based in part on Mesopotamian figures that he saw at the Met and in equal measure on American ads featuring glowing women he sometimes cut them out of magazines and sometimes even would cut out their smiles and paste them onto the surface of the painting. Now, uh, here's some more of the women. Uh, again, though this looks spontaneous, uh, these were worked on for months. The paint is thick in some places, thin in others. Some places it's opaque, some places it's translucent. 
so by the early 60s, de Kooning had moved out to Long Island, quite near where Pollock had lived, in fact, and began a series of landscapes that returned to a more fully abstract mode. Works like this one might remind you of the works of one of our most famous and best beloved painters of Northern California, Richard Diebenkorn, who indeed was inspired by de Kooning, certainly by his colors here. De Kooning continued painting through the 70s and 80s, creating luminous, luscious paintings. In the 80s, in failing health, he developed an entirely different abstract style using primary colors and open ribbon-like forms. Now, many consider these later works to have declined in quality, attributing this to the onset of some form of dementia. But other people say that painting like de Kooning's comes from intuition and instinct and the artist's hand and doesn't really have much to do with the brain at all. So he died in 1997. So I wanna do cover one more gesturalist and that is Joan Mitchell. While Lee Krasner and Elaine de Kooning were overshadowed by their powerful husbands in the macho New York art world, Joan Mitchell competed uh, with the big dogs and carved out a career that lasted until the late 80s. Now, uh, SF MoMA currently has a huge and exciting retrospective of her work. So if you aren't familiar with her, let's fix that right now. So Joan Mitchell was born in Chicago to a wealthy family who had an apartment on the 12th floor, I think it was 11th or 12th floor with a view of Lake Michigan. And she has said that all her painting starts in Lake Michigan. Her mother was a poet and was an editor of Poetry Magazine. So people like T.S. Eliot and Dylan Thomas came by the house. Uh, poetry was important to Mitchell and reading it was part of her painting process actually. And as a girl, she was both a serious art student and an accomplished athlete. I think she was a Midwestern junior ice skating champ, which will have consequences for the kind of painting that she does, that she was athletic and strong. Uh, she went to Smith College and received uh, her degree from the Art Institute of Chicago. And some of her early work will look like this, not surprising at all, kind of looking at Picasso and so forth. Now, she traveled in Europe where her paintings moved towards abstraction and where she met her husband, who later founded Grove Press in 1949. Returning to New York, she soon had a reputation as one of the leading younger uh, American abstract expressionist painters. She exhibited regularly in New York throughout the next four decades and maintained close friendships with many New York school painters and poets particularly, Though she returned frequently to France, she went back and forth. She divorced her husband in 1952, the year she had her first gallery show, where we see this work, Lyric. And the title of it, a Lyric, right, is poetry, tells us that poetry is important to her. And I think in the geometry of this work, you might see, uh, I see reflections of de Kooning's work, Asheville. De Kooning was a friend of hers and was um, kind of a mentor and helped her quite a bit and also exhibited in this um, show with her. Now, in 1955, she moved to France to be with the French Canadian artist and race car driver, Jean-Paul Riopelle. They had a long and tumultuous relationship maintaining separate homes, but eating together, drinking together and so forth. And they eventually moved from Paris to Vettoy, uh, quite near Monet's home at Giverny. Her painting masters were Matisse and Van Gogh, two of the greatest modern colorists, and she really learned their lessons well. So Joan is an American artist with a French soul. So having adopted abstraction in France in the late 40s, she stayed with that genre through a 50 year career that saw radical shifts in art. But as Rothko told us, subject was paramount to an abstract painting and hers were usually landscapes. She actually uh, used her paintings to reflect a feeling about something seen in the world, uh, water, trees, flowers. Um, she was more than anything else a landscapist. And she painted the way romantic poet William Wordsworth wrote a poem. He wrote about uh, the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings 
recollected in tranquility. And that's how she painted at night in her studio with music, with her dogs, sometimes reading poetry, reflecting afterwards what she had uh, experienced outdoors. Okay. So this one is called Hemlock. Uh, the title is from a line in a poem by Wallace Stevens. This is the first of several uh, paintings that were referred directly to poetry, which plays such a role in her works, particularly in the 70s. Okay, so now this one is called City Landscape. So she considered the city, right, to be a fit subject for a landscape painting too. And looking at this one, you want to start thinking about in what ways this does resemble a landscape. Well, it's got kind of a horizontal format, stuff at the top could be the sky. Certainly a city is full of bright colors like this. Certainly hemlock, we can see a tree in there, but this is a landscape she uses a lot. Um, her paintings were built slowly and carefully. She would stand back and look at a blank canvas in progress for long periods of time, decide where a mark should go, then approach the work and place the paint quickly and confidently. And you can often at the top of the paintings see the arc of her arm uh, at the top where she was extending her reach. In her work, we might say, uh, synthesizes a multitude of contrasting concepts and form, light and dark, warm and cool, space and density, growth and decay, gravity and lightness. Okay, some of her, um, um, some untitled works here. Colors were actually really uh, important to her. She reputedly had a form of synesthesia where she saw shapes as colors, green and white were somber, deathly colors to her. Yellow was her happy color. And apparently the mauve that she used reminded her of Riopelle, of her lover Riopelle. This, this is a nice one, untitled. And yeah, so uh, they moved in 1967. She bought a place in Betoy, as I said, out near um, Giverny, which gave her finally the space to create larger work. So at this point, she moves up and creates often triptychs. That way she could make them even larger uh, and keep them in her studio. Um, there's one. It's called No Rain. So this is a diptych, two pieces. And it's interesting in these to look at the difference between the two sides. On the right side is much denser than the other. And sometimes it's interesting to see that lines cross across from one side to another. She would sometimes work on these at the same time, other times not. Uh, let's see, this is La Vie en Rose. This is a huge work in four pieces done after her breakup with Ria Pell. And this is Bracket, which you know from SF MoMA, where you can see lines crossing from one to another. And it's also really interesting to look at the drips in the painting when you're doing a big thing like this. Sometimes they'll stop, which means she laid the canvas down. In other artists, they go sideways, means they're turning the canvas and so forth. And the white, she often uses it to push the other colors back. Um, let's see. Yeah, this is, whoops, what did I do? Whoop. There we go. That's no birds. This is a response to Wheatfield with Crows that just came up there by Van Gogh, uh, which she saw as kind of a suicidal painting on his part, but this, hers is called No Birds. Um, she was very ill in her last 10 years. She died of cancer and yet she continued that's uh, okay. To she continued to paint, paint huge paintings, and she said her works are about making a picture, not just letting it happen. And her works epitomize a shift in abstract expressionism from chance and hazard to something more controlled. Okay, now we're going to shift gears a bit, <clears throat> move to the other end of the spectrum, the smooth operators who give up wild surface agitation for large swaths of pure color. So stylistic oppositions of this sort <clears throat> are helpful, but the dichotomy is not always as clear as we might like. And so with the post-war split between gesturalists like Pollock, de Kooning, and Mitchell, 
and the color focused painters, there are connections between them, of course, as well as differences. Both of them were united by their belief in the power of abstraction, their belief that art's role was to reveal the unknown rather than um, um, report on the visible and their belief that the unconscious was the source of art and that an authentic painting expressed the artist's personality. Okay, and so we're gonna start with the king of color, Mark Rothko. Uh, he has the true soul of an existentialist as we can see in his famous quote here about the agony, ecstasy and doom he puts on the canvas, but he chooses kind of a new way to express it. Uh, Rothko's floating rectangles appear more introspective and possibly impassive than the work of de Kooning, say. But so rather than bravura gesture, Rothko relies on minimal inflection and color that seems to have seeped right into the canvas so that it draws attention to the surface and yet manages to su uh, suggest limitless space. But these color relationships take precedence over marks of emotional turmoil. Uh, Rothko did not claim that color was symbolic, but it was full of emotions for him and associations. Now, Mark Rothko was born in what's now Latvia in 1903. He and his family immigrated to the U.S. and settled in Oregon when he was 10. He attended Yale uh, in 1921, but he found it pretentious and racist, and he gave up his studies to move to New York, where he worked in the garment district before studying with at Parsons with Arshil Gorky, who comes up a lot here. He did receive an honorary degree from Yale 46 years later. In the 30s, he painted mostly street scenes and interiors while teaching children at the Brooklyn Jewish Children's Center, which he did for more than 20 years. He admired the approach, uh, the emotionality of children's art and uh, even started a book on similarities between children's art and modern art. And by the 40s, his works have a kind of biomorphic style reminiscent of some surrealists whose influence was strong in New York. But by 1947, he had eliminated all elements of surrealism or mythic imagery and these compositions of shapes emerged. He relies now on shapes rather than more symbolically ripe biomorphic motifs to convey emotional states. And he began to paint the edges of the stretched canvas, which he displayed without frames that combine them. There is more power, he said, in telling little than in telling all. He largely abandoned conventional titles in 1947 and resisted explaining the meaning of his work. Silence is so accurate, he said, and he feared that explanation like titles would just paralyze the viewer's imagination. So his works have sort of a watercolor style, though they're in oils. He diluted his pigments and applied the paint in very thin overlapping glazes, achieving a startling luminosity. The liquid paint soaks the canvas, leaving soft indistinct edges, sometimes with whitish outlines that suggest halos. Um, he was a little bit cagey about his technique um, but it, although it appears simple, it's actually richly varied. And he's one where you can occasionally see paint running up across the surface because he would invert a picture while working on it. So by 1950, he's reduced the number of floating rectangles to two, three, or four aligned vertically against a colored ground. This is his signature style. And uh, he would work on that in that format almost exclusively. Nevertheless, um, achieving an astonishing range of atmosphere and moods by varying the color and the tones. Now his work begins to darken in the 1950s, subsequent to his work on the disastrous first mural commission for the Four Seasons restaurant in the Seagram building in New York City. They had space for only seven murals, but Rothko eventually did 30 horizontal rather than his usual vertical format to fit the restaurant setting. Um, he was always uncomfortable with the elite. Why does that look like that? That's better, not that line. Um, and he told an interviewer that his goal in this commission was to create something that will ruin the appetite of every son of a bitch who ever eats in that room. And if that's not enough, that his paintings would make the patrons feel that they are trapped in a room where all the doors and windows are bricked up so that all they can do is butt their heads forever against the wall. 
All right, okay. So eventually Rothko decided that the installation completely was inappropriate for his works. And in 1960, he canceled the contract and returned Seagram's money. These works are now in three places, the Tate in London, the National Gallery in Washington, DC, and in a Japanese museum. And as you probably know, this incident has been memorialized, oops, there they are, <laughs> in a couple of films and in the play Red. There's Alfred Molina in it. Nevertheless, Rothko's star was rising and his paintings were collected by the very sons of bitches who ate at the Four Seasons, like the Rockefellers. He was even seated next to Joe Kennedy at JFK's inaugural ball in 1961. But the dark uh, Seagram's palette continued to dominate his work into the 60s, uh, early 60s, when he was working on the Rothko Chapel. Oh, I'm having trouble. Why I'm having trouble? There we are. Um, is uh, the Rothko Chapel paintings uh, in Houston, Texas. This is an enclosed octagonal space, uh, like a Byzantine church lending itself to meditation. And it was intended to be his final artistic statement, but he never saw these paintings, uh, which are so dark that there's practically no differentiation between shape and ground. He never saw them installed. Uh, his assistant found him dead on the kitchen floor on February 25th, 1970, having overdosed on barbiturates and cut an artery in his arm with a razor blade on the very day that the Seagram murals arrived at the Tate Gallery. Sad. Now we'll find more color and less evidence of the artist's hand in the works of Helen Frankenthaler, a second generation abstract expressionist who started what came to be called the color field style. Uh, as Marcel Duchamp said, art is either plagiarism or revolution, and Frankenthaler's poured sheets of color caused at least a minor revolution. Um, she seeks the least possible intervention in art making, relying on the quality of materials rather than reference either to the interior or exterior world. Um, a quote from the artist Frank Stella that kind of applies to Frankenthaler too, what you see is what you see. So she, let's have one here. She was born in 1928 to a privileged, cultured and progressive Jewish intellectual family. She interested in art began early. She studied with the Mexican painter Rufino Tamayo while she was still at the Dalton School. And after graduation from Bennington, she studied with Hans Hoffman. She was staggered by Jackson Pollock's first exhibition in 1950. It was all there, she said. I wanted to live in this land. I had to live there and master the language. Um, by 1951, she had a gallery contract and her first show. And in 1952, she debuted this work, Mountains and Sea, the debut of her painting method, where she pours thinned paint directly onto raw, unprimed canvas on the studio floor, working from all sides to create these floating fields of translucent color. Now, she had learned from Pollock, it's true, but Pollock's dribbled enamel paints kind of stay on the surface of the canvas. Frankenthaler's uh, soak in and become part of the canvas, almost like a watercolor. Now, this painting launched her career. Uh, it was done after a trip to Nova Scotia, and it does um, call into question exactly how non-representational it is. Likewise, this one, Basque Landscape, it has a suggestion of landscape about it, for sure. Um, but it's abstract, and through the 50s, her works tended to be centered compositions like this, with the majority of the painting happening in the middle, the edges are kind of unimportant. But later she began to work with um, linear shapes and more organic sun-like rounded forms in her works, such as this one, that's at SF MoMA. In the 60s, she moved towards more symmetrical kinds of paintings and she began to paint strips of color near the edge of the paintings. And here, as you can see, she began to make use of single stains and blots of solid color against white backgrounds, often kind of geometric shapes. Now her soak stain was really the ultimate fusing of image and canvas, drawing attention to the flatness of the painting itself. But the oil in the paints eventually causes the canvas to discolor and rot away. So beginning with this work, Pink Lady, she started using acrylics rather than oil paints. They're brighter, they spread easily, they dried quickly, and they can be of various, um, either thin or opaque on the surface. 
And her colors almost remind us of fauvism. They're so bright, right? And she changes her style a little bit, exploring the edges, exploring the center. And by her late works in the 80s, we have um, large uh, character works that are characterized as much calmer use of muted colors. And uh, she was by this time using a brush to put the paint on as well. And there she goes. Um, at her death in 2011, she was 83, Grace Gluck's obituary in the New York Times summed up her career by saying that critics have not unanimously praised her work. Some see it as thin in substance, uncontrolled, too sweet in color, too poetic, but she still had a gift for freedom, spontaneity, openness, and complexity, not exclusively of the studio or of the mind, but explicitly and intimately tied to nature and human emotions. So got five minutes left, I want to look at another artist of this second generation color field group, one who took the free unstretched uh, canvas of Pollock and Frankenthaler one step further, making it a kind of painting sculpture. Um, in the 1960s, pop art and minimalism in different ways were responding to the emotional interior focused abstract expressionism. Uh, and they did this by turning to the everyday in subject and materials. And my last painter, Sam Gilliam, brought abstraction into conversation with the everyday when he was inspired by seeing laundry hanging on a line, seen out his studio window, uh, inspired him to hang rather than stretch his canvases. So as an African-American artist in DC at the height of the civil rights movement, Gilliam's art was not just an aesthetic statement. It was a way of distancing himself from the white power structures inherent in abstract art. And in that turbulent decade, though, not too many Black artists were interested in abstraction, but Gilliam was. Here we go. So that's the kind of work he does. He was born in Tupelo, Mississippi, uh, received art training from the University of Louisville and moved to DC in 1962. And he tried various experimental techniques with canvas before hitting on his signature draping in 1968. So here, the way the canvas is prepared and presented is both the method and a metaphor too. He did make works, abstract works that referenced um, social issues. Uh, April 4th, whose title references the day in 1968 when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Um, he was in Washington DC. He saw looting and fires that broke out uh, along 14th Street on news of King's death. But a year later when he made this painting, the damage still remained unrepaired. So in this work, there's a darkness that suggests trauma, but a luminous majestic color honors King in his work, we might say, implying a sense of hope. So here's another really large work of his. Um, he describes the tension between sculptural and pictorial qualities as being similar to the familiar push-pull of color in traditional, ab traditional abstract painting, which comes from the ideas of Hans Hoffmann. And he likes that his works will never be hung the same way twice. As the folds change, so do the paintings. Here's one uh, outside the museum in Philadelphia. It's called Seahorses because he discovered that the, um, uh, the bronze rings circling the museum's uh, facade in Greek mythology were used to tie seahorses to Neptune's temple. And he did other forms of work like this one, this, uh, kind of similar in a way to what Robert Rauschenberg did. This has clothing, a backpack, painter's tools, a wooden closet pole and so forth in it. And he went in different ways doing dynamic geometric collages, black paintings he called them, where he has dense monochrome paint, which he collaged cut and reused on different, um, uh, on other canvases. And some of his paintings are even reminiscent of African patchwork quilts. Now, he, of all the people I've talked about, is still alive. And let me show you what this 80-year-old has been doing recently. <laughs> this is some work he did for the Marrakesh Biennial. 
this work called And Yet Do I Marvel. It's a line from a poem by County Cullen. This is 28 feet across, separated into five colorful panels with glassy varnish surfaces. This is a commission for the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Now, in 1972, Gilliam represented the U.S. at the Venice Biennale. He was the first African-American artist to do so. And in 2017, he exhibited at the Venice Biennale once again in the Central Pavilion. And he did this work, Eve Klein Blue. So as we come to an end here, um, I'm wondering, and I'm sure you're wondering, in this world of installation art, uh, sound art, land art, street art, NFTs, is there still room for abstract painting? And the answer is yes, there's still here. And the abstract painters of today are building on the work of the past and making it new in their own ways, such as Julie Moretu, who uses um, images from charts and maps and geometry to create her works. She's the painter of the two large works as you enter the lobby of SF MoMA, or the work of the fabulous Mark Bradford, California artist who makes his abstract works through collage of paper that he scavenges in his environment, posters and so forth, soaks them down, puts them on the canvas and scrapes them down and uses a sander to scrape them down again, or in the work of Mary Weatherford, another California artist who has a fairly traditional uh, sort of paint application here, but she has enlivened it with, um, what do you call them? Bits, <laughs> strings, I don't know what you call them, of, of neon light that uh, reflect on the painting. So there is still lots of abstract art to see, and I know it can be difficult to look at, to kind of get a sense of, and I hope I've helped you maybe understand how to do that. And I hope you go see uh, Joan Mitchell at uh, SF MoMA. It's a wonderful exhibit. So um, I came in on time here, <laughs> Sariana. Um, if anybody uh, has any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. <laughs> I'm going to stop the recording now before the Q&A. So okay. bye to everybody on the record who's watching the recording.